Welcome back to World War II TV and a rare uh, pre-recorded show for reasons that I will explain one day. Anyway, it is often said that the troops facing the German Battle of the Bulge offensive were green. Not so with the American 28th Division, veterans of the recent Hertgen campaign stroke debacle. To talk about their role in the Battle of the Bulge is Walter Zapotochny. Good afternoon, Walter. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me, Paul. I appreciate it. So I will just start with the idea we often talk about in this channel that certain units within the US Army, British Army get more attention, get more praise than others. There's lots of units people write about. The 28th Division, I would venture, are one of the ones towards the bottom of the list. You've written lots of books on lots of subjects. Was there a particular reason why the 28th Infantry Division came into your reckoning? Well, I, I joined the 28th uh, Infantry Division National Guard as a young man. That'll explain it. And uh, I, at that point, I really didn't know a lot about it. You know, there really wasn't a lot of information put out. You know, they gave you a little card that kind of generally talked about what the 28th Division had done in the Second World War and in World War I. But as I got older, you know, I started looking at it a little bit more. And then I was fortunate. Um, I spent almost 30 years in the military and I went on active duty with the National Guard and was assigned as the 28th Division Command Historian for a couple of years before I retired. The division commander uh, wanted to uh, take another shot at uh, trying to get the presidential unit citation for mm. the 110th Infantry uh, Regimental Combat Team who had fought, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit if you like, um, in the center part of their, of their uh, front uh, when the Germans attacked, you know, uh, on the 16th of, uh, of December. And, um, so, uh, attempts over the years had been su unsuccessful, and he felt that, uh, you know, he wanted me to go over to Europe and talk to some folks over there and some of the local historians and see if we could find out more information that would substantiate another claim for the mm. presidential unit citation. So I met folks from uh, the circle from the, for the study of the Battle of Bulge, Siba in Luxembourg, who, by the way, do an outstanding they job do. of yeah. commemorating and providing tours for family members and veterans. I mean, to this day, they, they do an excellent job. So, you know, that's how it kind of got started. And then after I retired for a while, I said, you know what, I'm going to, we, we were unsuccessful, by the way. They turned us down again for the presidential unit citation for a lot of reasons. But uh, I said, I'm going to write a book, and hopefully that will help maybe get more attention to what the 110th did hmm. during the Battle of the Bulge. So that's how kind of how it, it started in terms of writing about it. And then it's just been, you know, I'm, I'm a board member of the 20th Division Association, and we've just been working on trying to – keep the heritage and, and the story and the honors of the 20th division in the forefront yeah. you know, as we go forward here. No, exactly. And that's why we're, we're touching it because I, I, over the course of the years I've been doing this, we've covered most of the units uh, facing the Germans, in the battle of Bulge, and indeed some of the German units. And it's about time we got to 28. We had covered them in the hurt gun before, but so let's set the scene because we, you know, we're not discussing the hurt gun today, but you couldn't really ask for a, in English, we would say a stickier wicket for any unit to go through than the Hergen Forest. The objectives, the reasoning behind it, the necessity of it is open to debate by everybody still. And the conditions, the, the weather, the, everything about it is just miserable. And they come out of that. So what stage were they in terms of their morale when they pull out of there in, in November? Well, by, by the way, I, I visited the Hurricane Forest uh, right before Christmas last year and got a chance to walk the call trail with the SEBA folks again. Oh, we must have missed out each other by, by a couple of weeks because I was there last November. Oh, is that right? Oh. Um, well, you know then, uh, as well as I discovered, how difficult that terrain is, and uh, it, it just drained them. Um, they were under constant German artillery barrages. Ammunition would explode. The artillery rounds would explode in the trees by purpose. And, you know, it's multiple effective splinters, et cetera. The weather was bad. Uh, it was very difficult to get supplies to them. So they were beaten. Uh, they left uh, with 6,184 casualties, uh, almost 700 dead and a number missing. And um, they needed a rest. And the Allies thought that uh, Luxembourg, west of the Ore River, would be a good quiet sector to go into. And um, you can see the red is the Siegfried line or, or basically the Ore River there. And um, the 28th uh, uh, has a sector there. Um, 
man, and they manned about a 25 mile defensive front from Bollendorf in the south, bordering the 9th Armored Combat Command A, to uh, Sevenig along the Ore River north, bordering the 106th Division. The traditional front of a division at that time, now it's changed a little bit, but at that time was about eight miles. So you can see. The Allies thought that nothing's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. They gave them a 25-mile front to defend. There's no way that they could defend it in a continuous line. So they they set up what they called strong points or strong point positions with large gaps in between. And those strong points were road junctions, were uh, village, uh, you know, street intersections, uh, churches, steeples, those types of things, thinking that if uh, they did see German activity, they could at least do something to slow them down and to delay their advance. They were in the midst of refitting. Um, many of the men thought that, uh, you know, they were going home for Christmas. The war's over. You know, mm-hmm. there's not going to be any more for them. They've seen their action in Hurtgen Forest. Uh, prior to that, in Siegfried Line, it came across France, you know, and they figured this is it. So there was USO shows. There was leaves back to Paris to uh, other towns in Belgium, you know, and uh, it was pretty relaxed. And they had listening posts out and uh, along the Ore River, but the Germans were used a, a very unique tactic. What they would do is every couple of weeks, they would uh, bring a lot of equipment uh, and make a lot of noise. And the Americans thought that they were just changing out their, their units and changing out their equipment. So that when the time came for them to cross the Ore River, the Americans heard this noise. It was no different than the noise they've been hearing for mm. weeks. And one of the reasons, of course, they were taken by surprise. You know? I'm glad you mentioned that deception aspect because we have a collective understanding. The Allies, we're, we're the ones that use deception. You know, we're, we're the ones that the desert onwards. We're, we're the ones using um, the camouflage units and all that. And we forget that the Axis are learning as well. And uh, the, the Germans in this particular cage, as you, as you clearly pointed out there, have done their own, played their own little uh, uh, joker, we would say, in, in, in this terms of deception there. But Well, they were, they were very good at it. They, they were very good at it. Actually. They were. I want to bring you this. If there's one positive to take out the Hergen Forest, and I, and I, I, I wouldn't say that in front of a 28th Division veteran uh, or a 4th Division guy, but if there is one, it would be that if you've got a grasp of tactics, you've got a gra- grasp of terrain, you do understand coming out of there the importance of valleys, roads, maneuver, and how armies can move through high ground. So, yes, they've been given a terrible you know, 25-mile frontage. The, the, the division is under strength. But if there's any unit that could come out of the herk and say, okay, they're likely to use this road here. That's the valley we want to be covering. If we hit and sit on that high ground there, we can watch over there. Do you sense there was any sense of good preparation, despite the fact that there's this overwhelming offensive coming in their direction? Do you think their strong points were well sighted? Well, yes, I think they were well uh, placed. Uh, and they, they knew that the Ardennes forest is, there are a lot of trees. It's not armor friendly. So the uh, limited road network that was in Luxembourg and in Belgium at the time, the Germans, and they knew that the Germans, in order to move their tanks, had to follow those roads. And they had to own those roads. They had to own those road inter- intersections. So the American commanders, uh, down to the very you know company level, uh, which, by the way, had a lot of discretion as to where they were placing these defensive uh, positions, um, they understood that. And especially since their experience at the Hurtgen Forest, you know, uh, they understood that and they tried to place uh, gun positions, booby traps, you know, machine gun uh, setups, those types of things, and tanks and anti-tank weapons in areas where they, they thought they were pretty certain the Germans would have had to come in through. And many of those villages that were that they fought so fiercely and, you know, the Germans had no choice. They had to go through there mm. because the armor is not going to go through trees, you know, and um, the Americans knew that. So they did a pretty good job, I think, of uh, setting up those what they called strong points or strong point positions. Brilliant. So let's let's now I'll let you kind of take over the presentation. I will jump in with some questions. But the Battle of the Bulge, everyone thinks they know the story, you know, and, and it, it's not that it's false, but, you know, they hear the sound of engines up and down the front, the weather's bad, and columns of German armor starts pouring at them from these roads and through the trees there, and, and everybody's taken completely by surprise. But 
take us to whichever regiment you want to. I know the 110th is is your baby, but you know you, you, you said there's been an atmosphere of people going back and forth on leaves. They're they're refitting. They've set up well, but there's not much level of expectation. And then suddenly, you know, well, it, it all kicks off. So t- tell us what it would have been like in one of those listening posts or one of those CPs. Well, a little after 5 a.m. on the 16th, artillery barrage has started all along the division sector, division's front. And um, even initially, I don't think the soldiers felt that this was a major invasion. You know, it's just the fire artillery at them because we did the same thing. But then as the, um, the hours and minutes and hours moved on, they began to realize that Germans are crossing the Ore River in mass. You know, they're, they've crossed, they've captured and crossed the uh, bridge at uh, Dosberg, so they're bringing uh, tanks across. And uh, then, you know, the, the feeling that, look, this is, this is for real. They're coming. And even the Allied command at that point, I'm talking about later in the day, didn't have a full appreciation of what was happening, mm. even though the people on the front were telling them, look, they're, they thought it was a probe. They thought it were probing actions. Well, when you have a, the 6th Panzer Army in the north and the 5th Panzer Army in the south and the 7th below them coming is a little bit more than probing actions. All right, so what happened? The American soldiers, the 20th Division soldiers manned their strong points. The initial um, wave of uh, German attackers, mainly infantry, came up. And for the most part, they were rebuffed uh, with some pretty heavy casualties. So they were grouped a bit. And they realized that, uh, you know, there's some defensive positions going on here that they need to uh, either bypass or attack. And so they kept building up their strength accordingly. And um, every time they tried to get around those American positions, the Americans would fight them back, the division soldiers. And it got to the point where uh, they really had to bring a lot of armor and a lot of uh, reinforcements up. And in some cases, they just bypassed the strong points. Interesting thing that I found when I was doing my research, reading some German documents, is that some of the German commanders uh, wrote after that they were very upset with some of the smaller unit commanders, the lower level commanders, because they were told in their briefings, if you're getting too much resistance from the defenders, bypass them, go around them, you know, and isolate them. Well, they chose not to do that. They said, no, we're going to fight them. Well, in doing that, they got thrown off their timetable. So the uh, original uh, timetable was for the Germans to, I'm talking about the 6th and the 5th yep. uh, Panzer Divisions, to be to reach the line around uh, from St. Vith to Bastogne around December 18th. And the River Meuse, which was a little bit further west by the 20th. Then, of course, the end objective was to seize Antwerp. And I, as many of people who studied this, uh, think that had they not been delayed by the 28th Division in those strong points, in those small villages, um, if they would have blown right through Bastogne, because 101st Airborne would have never been there. There yeah. was only a small contingent there. Now, there's debate to this day about whether their logistics would have held up enough to really get them to Antwerp because they were having some supply problems. They were having logistic problems. But the point is, the, the, there wouldn't have been a 101st stand in, in Belgium, in, in uh, Bastogne, had it not been for those, those men of the 28th Division that delayed them long enough, and in some cases to the last man, to the last round of ammunition. There were cooks and um, office personnel that manned the castle in Clairvaux, and the Germans kept firing at it and firing at it, and they set it on fire, and they still wouldn't give up. And finally, they were out of ammunition, they were out of hope, and they had to surrender. But the time it took for the Germans to bring those positions down was long enough. And that's where I don't think the 28th gets enough credit. Mm. Because, again, you know, I'm not trying to take anything away, and none of us are trying to take anything away from the 101st Airborne. What they did at Bastogne is tremendous. But they wouldn't have been there. <laughs> the, the, the roads network was good. And that armor, um, once they got on the road network, that had just blasted right through it, gone, or surrounded, or gone around it, and on onto Antwerp, you know. So, I, I think there's 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 a number of reasons. Um, some of it was politics. Some of it was the reports were were badly written. Um, that 
the 28th never really got the recognition that they should have. Um, there were some people in the center of military history at the time that uh, were more inclined to give credit to an active army unit as opposed to what was a National Guard unit. Yep. So, you know, there, there's a number of factors. I don't know if we can ever pinpoint the specific reason, but there was a number of reasons. And that's what some of us are trying to do now. We're trying to, um, you know, coming on this show to talk to you and talk to your viewers about uh, uh, giving them a better understanding of what the 28th Division soldiers really did. I did my doctoral dissertation, and I have a book coming out in next May um, about, we, I talk a good bit about the things they did, but more importantly for the book and my, for my dissertation and the book is why they did what they did. And we, we look very closely at the effort that took place even before they left the United States in getting people to understand the reasons they were going off to Europe to fight, fighting for the American way of life in, in what was promoted, uh, freedom of religion, freedom from want, freedom, you know, all those things. And uh, that's what I try to address in the book. There's a lot of books that have been written about the Battle of the Bulge. A lot of them focus on, you know, the 90th Division, the 106th, uh, the 101st Airborne, to some extent, the 82nd Airborne, and, and it's all good stuff. They're, they fought bravely. But this is the missing piece. Why? What did they do? What was the effect of it? And to me, what was fascinating is why they did it. They were not going to give up. And I've interviewed many veterans that were there and read many interviews from that were of veterans that were there. And just about everybody to the last man said, no, we're not letting them beat us. We're fighting for our way of life and for the life of the people that lived in Europe, which is really the same thing. You know, the, the, the citizens of Belgium, the citizens of France, the citizens of Luxembourg. And it's very, it, to me, it's also the fact I wouldn't quite say they'd had their asses kicked in the Hurricane Forest because it's too simplistic and it's, it's not really fair. But they haven't come out of it as many British units in that part of the war are facing similar, but they haven't come out of it on a high, shall we say. But it's like in sport, isn't it? If you've just had a drubbing, the next match that comes in, you're going to absolutely do your best. There's, you, you're going you're gonna to try and turn it round and come out there. And I would think that that's going to give, in addition to knowing what they're there, they're fighting there for, for you know, the, for home, for America, for mom's apple pie, as we Brit, Brits would yeah. say about you guys. But they're also, it's, you've got to take a bit of revenge. I don't like revenge. You know, I don't think soldiers ever go into combat with the idea of revenge, but evening the, evening the odds, I think maybe, you know, just getting, getting a bit of a, a reaction to what's happened. So, I, you know, you could make the point that the hurt gun in that sense gave them even more incentive to hold the line and do something better there. Well, I think you make a very good point. You know, what happened in Malmedy, um, it's interesting how that news got around so quickly to the front and probably more quickly than orders would have got around, you know, the, the liking of the commanders. But it, it, it caught on like wildfire and people knew. And they said, you know, uh, again, I don't know if it's revenge per se, but it's, uh, you know, it's more of a determined effort to not let the Germans win. They're not going to take away from us our basic freedoms or the freedoms of Europe. And many of the soldiers, I, uh, veterans I talked to, it wasn't just the American way of life. Mm. They knew they were there fighting for the Europeans, for those countries, too, because yeah. they're like us. They just want to live, raise their kids, earn a living, you know. Mm. And... Um, that's what I tried to address in the in the so, dissertation so, and the, in the like I said in the book. In the book, and we, we'll we'll invite you back in May when it comes out and, and do another little bit of publicity for it. So, um, you know, we've talked about the the hundred and first airborne again. You know, I've been there many times. I've got, had many friends who fought there, and it, it's a notable and interesting and important action. But it, it's also, from a military point of view, quite easy to explain. You're surrounded. There's a town. There's seven roads coming into it, and the hundred first put a you know a ring around it and try and stop everything getting in. It's it's you can visualize it very quickly. You if you if you need to you know draw a diagram on a chalkboard, you can you can set the scene very quickly and you just say yeah, so three twenty seventh of there, five oh second there, five oh first, etc. 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 When you're getting into some of the other units in the Ardennes, it does get a bit more complicated because the Germans are using roads parallel to each other as opposed to all pulling into the same location. As you said, there you've got a these separate strong points, so therefore command and control becomes an issue because you've got communication problems. So it would make it 
a lot harder to explain it to someone. If you don't have any kind of maps explaining what the 28th are doing, you could pull out, as you have done, you know, Belgian and Luxembourg village names, but that doesn't necessarily explain it very well. So, so take us back again. These, these you know, so some strong points they're kind of holding on. Some of the Germans after kind of attempting to go around and around and buy them in that situation. How how did tw- the twenty eight divisions communications hold up? How did their control hold up? Are there any key figures, you know, battalion commanders, regimental commanders, the divisional commanders themselves that you think come out of this with strength? I mean. We could go on a whole rabbit hole about General Cota. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, as a Normandy guy, I love him to bits because Cota's draw off Omaha Beach is one of my staples of my battlefield tours, you know. But within the division, where are the heroes in the, in terms of keeping a control on this? Well, you know, the communications landline were cut pretty pretty early on um, because of the artillery barrages. So they were really left with um, radio communication, which was – you know, spotty at best in some cases. Um, you know, there are a lot of heroes. Uh, I, I wrote in, in my book um, a number of um, examples of people who won various awards because of the valid actions that they did. Uh, you know, Commanders Rudder, uh, who commanded the Ranger Battalion on the, uh, in, when they stormed Normandy, ended up being a commander in the 28th Division. Uh, Strickler, uh, uh, you know, who commanded the, the 110th. Um, who uh, was in Clairvaux. Um, you know, it, it goes on and on. Uh, Lieutenant Maddox, who was the uh, commander of a gun position in Clairvaux near the rail station. I've been there. He stood in front of uh, an attacking uh, German with, uh, who, who had was fired on the, his men with machine gun and took the brunt of the, of the machine gun fire. He later passed away in a German field hospital. I mean, you can just go on and on. But again, in the book, I have a lot of examples, a lot of interviews, and a lot of uh, stories about people who who did what they needed, needed to do. It's hard to pinpoint one, you know, there are a lot of heroes. And what makes a person a hero? I think, again, um, they fought for, I think it came to the point, um, Paul, where they're there, they're thinking they're going home for Christmas. They think it's over and no, it's not. And they said, you know, enough. We're not going to let this happen again. Enough. And they literally fought to the last man in many cases. Brilliant stuff. They couldn't fight anymore, you know. You see the Septietric Six Panzer armies up in the north there, you know, and their mission was, is, this was designed as like a pincer movement to move on to Antwerp from the north and from um, the south, primarily uh, 5th Panzer Army in the south, but the 7th below them as a supporting unit. When Septietrich's 6th Panzer Army got into the Essenborn Ridge and was held up by the 99th, and by the way, a lot of people don't know that one detachment from the 112th, the 20th Division, 112th Infantry served with the 99th Division at Essenborn Ridge. They, they held them up. They couldn't go anywhere. So in a really, it boiled down to has some of Monteufel's 5th Panzer Army in the south to make this happen. He had to go through Bastogne to get to Antwerp if they were going to stay on their timetable because they knew that the Allies, once they figured out what was going on here, they weren't just going to sit around. You know, They were going to bring reinforcements in. So the idea was to capture Antwerp as soon as possible, split the British from the Americans, um, disrupt the Allies, and sue for peace. You know, that's what the whole thing was about. It fell down. It fell upon then uh, Monteufel's 5th Panzer Army to make this happen. And that's where the 28th Division took the brunt of nine divisions of attack and held long enough that, you know, again, the 101st and other units, not just the 101st. 101st gets most of the credit for Bastogne, but there are many other units that fought there and were deployed along with them. Um, and, of course, the 4th Armored Division coming up after and – I don't know if you had a chance to walk uh, Patton's route to Bastogne to, to take that road. I did that last uh, year. Yeah, and driven it and walked. And not that wasn't last year. They did that about well, actually, probably about seven or eight years ago now. Yeah, well, they've reestablished. They've established some new markers along the way and some mm-hmm. new monuments and so on. If you have, I, I'd do it again. I mean, I'd recommend doing it again. It's pretty nice. Um, so anyway, these units come up there. My father, by the way, served with General Patton in the Fourth Armored Division. Mm. He was in Company C Eighth Tank at the time. And so that, that's one of the other reasons I got interested, too. You know, when I find out what my father did, you know, it, it kind of said, I need to find out some more about this. You know? So when Dietrich was 
kind of stopped. Manteuffel had to move along, and he was frustrated, again, with some of his lower commanders because they wouldn't bypass those units. They wanted to fight them. They wanted to fight those strong points. That cost them dearly. I don't know if you heard of Morley Cassidy. He was a New York Times uh, CB, CBS uh, radio reporter. He was embedded with the 28th Division. He said, quote, the 28th Division has performed one of the greatest feats in the history of the American Army. Against nine divisions, it has held so firmly that the German timetable has been thrown off completely. Close quote. I had and, heard that before. Yeah, it's an amazing and, quote. And you can't, I mean, he sums it up. That, that's exactly what happened. So, again, why have many historians just, yeah, those units at the front were overrun. And 101st stood by, you know, it just bypassed the 28th completely. I mean, there's probably many reasons. But Well, let's unpack some of that now. I mean, I'll, I'll, my, my take is, is that, you know, because I know that doing a YouTube channel is that I know that certain shows will fly and get lots of views and certain ones won't because – People like a neat package. They like it's like a movie. You don't. I watched a crime drama on TV last night, and it was one of those ones. After two hours, it didn't actually end. It didn't resolve it. It was the little things with Denzel Washington and Rami Malek, and it was like, okay, I've wasted two hours of my life. There's no conclusion. We don't know whether the killer did it or not, right? And I think with the 101st, people watching this going, he's going off on movies now. But with the 101st in Baston, you have that conclusion of fourth armored arriving. You have a link up. You have a, and they were surrounded. The airdrops come in. The supplies come in. The pathfinders there bring in the thing. The, the, the weather clears. It's a perfect way to bring a story to an end and you go and you can satisfyingly put the book down or close the documentary and go done and for me the 28th doesn't have that neat ending in the ardennes it, it's as you said yourself absolutely vital in delaying that advance absolutely pivotal role in in setting up the map so that the 101st can go in and do that job in baston that we're in no way knocking at all but it doesn't come to end. Some of the division were captured. Some were killed. And wounded. it doesn't, is that part of why it doesn't get told? It doesn't conclude well in terms of storytelling. Yeah, I think you're right. I, you know, it, you're right. Uh, the story of Bastogne is a neat movie script. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you have a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, um, what was the end for the 20th division? Well, a lot of people don't realize that the one, the survivors blended themselves you know, they, they, they retreated, if you will, back to Wilts, which was the division yeah. headquarters, and then further west to Basta. And they were absorbed among the 101st and 82nd Airborne's defense in Basta. So they fought alongside them, having already fought the Germans on the Ore River, you know. Um, yeah, I think that's probably it. There's, a, there's so many individual stories that I've uh, discovered Um from the north to the south, 112th mm. through the 110th to the 109th, that um, d don't necessarily wrap up into a neat package, you know, mm. as you suggest. But in it, in their sum, in their total, it is a pretty neat package when you think about what. Yeah, it, it, it's how it's how you address it and how you tell it. And you know, exactly. I'm, I'm, I can I, I'm going to ask something to you now that I will, though we're an ocean apart, I will feel the anger rising within you, but. Movies, documentaries. We talked about it just before we, went, we we started recording. You know, Castle Keep with Burt Lancaster, Band of Brothers. There's often that scene where the bedraggled 28th Division unit come back in their great coats, whatever it is, looking like they've done 20 rounds with Mike Tyson, and they hand over their ammunition to the 101st or whoever the hero would be in this particular thing there, and mm -hmm. they're seen as the the defeated, the bedraggled, the retreating. Um, that must absolutely infuriate you and it must infuriate 28 division veterans and their families when they're seeing that, because it's such an, a warped perspective of reality. So it, does it anger you? Well, I'm not, really, I'm not really angry. I get, I understand, you know, I, I get, and we've talked about some of it. I get what, how it's spun. Even the, um, uh, some of the senior historians uh, within the army uh, just, poo-pooed what the 20s did. I mean, they, you know, uh, it's all about the 101st, um, which is amazing because, you know, these are, you know, these are PhDs in history that have had a long history of uh, long experience in writing uh, about combat stories, yet they chose not to really try to understand. You know, it could, I've read the number of things that have been written at the uh, Command and General Staff College out in Fort Leavenworth. It was out there for a little bit uh, on some tours. 
some of the actions of the members of the 28th Division are captured in some of those studies. So the new staff officers coming coming down the road now can read some of that and understand it. But again, it's not a neat package. If you go from the north to the south, it's there's different stories everywhere. It doesn't sum up into a again to use the overused phrase neat package. It just doesn't. But yet each of those stories is a story in itself. It really mm-hmm. is. You can take the stand at the castle in Clairvaux, the um, what the heroes at Hoshinden did, in Monarch uh, at the hotel in, 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 in you know, in. Well, expand them on those for us. You've got the platform. Tell us one of those stories. Well, I read about it, a lot about them in the book and the specific details about them. You know, um, I, I talked a little bit about what. Uh, Captain Maddox or Lieutenant Maddox did at that gun position in Clairvaux. Uh, the the castle was an interesting one. The castle in Clairvaux is an interesting story because the Germans wanted that castle, and it was just a handful of defenders, cooks, clerks, you know, who were not going to give it up. And finally, they ran out of it. The Germans set it on fire. They set the castle on fire. Finally, um, they just the defenders decided, well, you know, we we don't have any more ammunition. The castle's on fire. What are we going to do here? You know, we've done what we can do. There are stories of uh, people who were staying on the radio when the Germans are about to overrun them uh, in the 112th area, as an example, and uh, make sure that they were able to signal back uh, what they saw and what, the, what they saw that the Germans were doing till the very last. And then the radio went silent, you know, and just so many, so many stories. I have to ask, we talked about the general, you know, Norman Dutch Cota. I mean, and I, I to, to relate a rather humorous story, I was on uh, the Dog White Center of Omaha Beach about 10 years ago with a group uh, of tourists, and my, my group had a veteran with them, and I bumped into a tour guide friend of mine who had a group with a veteran with him, and I forget who had which veteran. I think I had the 29, and the other guy had the 28th Division guy. Or it may have, may have been the other way around. Anyway, we're all there on Omaha Beach. These two groups are meeting. These two veterans are exchanging greetings and what are you doing in Europe, blah, 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 blah. And I, and, and then the subject of the general came up and <laughs> the two of them nearly got into fisticuffs. And the 29th Division guy said, I would have, you know, taken a bullet for that guy. He was the best commanding officer that I ever faced in my 25 years. And, you know, it was led by my 25 years of military. The, the guy was an absolute genius. And, you know, they, they get a, and the 28th Division guy was, no, no, he was terrible. He was a murderer. He did everything. And we had to kind of pull these two guys who were in their early 80s apart. As a historian, as someone who's looked at this, you studied this, you know, with a lot of these military figures, you can't just say they're good or bad. They have good days. They have bad days. They have ele- areas where they do better. And but what's your appraisal of, of the general from from your twenty eighth division perspective? I mean, people say he's out of his depth there. He was good as an a- assistant divisional commander, but not so good as a divisional commander. Break break him down for us. Well, I think uh, as you suggest, like a lot of these commanders, you know, it's it, it depends on your perspective. Yeah. You know? uh, he was trained. I mean, you know, he he he, um, he had had some experience. I think part of the problem with the twenty eighth is that again they were they, they were even sent into the Hurtgen Forest without everything they needed, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and certainly when they went to Luxembourg, they they were starting to refit them and re, and and replace the uh, losses, you know, in terms of personnel and so on. But you know, the support just wasn't there. And, you know, you can blame Coda and say, well, he didn't have the support. He didn't know what he was doing. But if you don't have the material, the um, logistical support, the uh, command support from the rear, you know, a good example, I think, of how we can perceive people is is Patton. Mm -hmm. You know, Patton is revered as a tremendous commander. He's done many, many things. My father served with him. But yet he slaps a soldier in Italy. which is but many people perceive as a negative side of, of Patton and his temper, you know? So I don't know. I, th- I think I'm going to give him a, a benefit of the doubt and say that, uh, you know, he was a victim of circumstances here to a large extent. No, that's a, that's a fair and balanced response. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned um, as well, you know, going into the hurt gun with less than adequate supplies, because I think that is something about the U S army, the winter of 44, 45, 
there's a perception that we're on a roll now. Normandy's behind us. You know, we're, we're pushing up through Italy, and it's you know the, the end is in sight now. But that winter is it's the worst for um, foot problems. It's the worst in weather. It's the wor- worst for desertion. Morale is low. Crime is up within the, the U.S. and British armies. You know, trench foot. The new cold weather gear that has been developed hasn't reached everybody yet. Um, and and the army is not in quite as good a state as it probably should be, given it's come off the back of a successful and swift Normandy campaign, the 28th have a role towards the latter part of that and and perform perform admirably there. And some of the pushes on through the rest of uh, France by the, the American uh, army is, is fantastic. And then it... It hits this this wall in the winter. Both both the west, both literally the west wall, uh, and figuratively they hit the weather. They hit this burnout period as well. I mean, you know, you 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 said you you know thirty year military career, and, and and lots of people have studied combat effectiveness, and 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 a unit like the twenty eighth who've been at, at the sharp end, and we we started this by talking about how miserable the Hurtgen was. You have to cut them some slack, especially the commanders, especially anybody with any responsibility. By the time they get to the middle of December, these guys, yeah, they've had a couple of weeks off, but you're going to need more than a couple of weeks off to recharge batches after what they've been through. So is that is that, is that a view we've, we've kind of overlooked over the years? We tend to think of units as being kind of, kind of mechanical and we forget they're made up of human beings. I think you're, you hit the nail right on the head. And uh, you're right, in a couple of weeks. I mean, they were just coming out of the Hurtgen Forest, and all of a sudden the Germans are attacking. I mean, they weren't, they really didn't have very much time, you know, to refit and to, you have to, we have to also remember, a lot of people don't realize this, they lost a lot, they lost a lot of their commanders. Yeah. In Hurtgen. And, well, when they attacked the uh, Siegfried Line initially, but then Hurtgen. So now it, it, we're not the same team, we're not the same group that trained in England that left on those ships and landed on the 22nd, you know, on, on Normandy on the beach. They're not the same. Um, the division all, had almost, almost a hundred percent. Well, not quite, but maybe 90% turnover in leadership from the time they trained in England to the battle of the bulge. Mm. Think about that. I mean, yeah. that, I think a lot of people who don't really have never been in the military, you don't understand the importance of developing that team and building that team. And, ha- and, and you know, because soldiers, when they get to know each other, they fight for each other. Yeah. You know? I'll jump in there because th- there's the perception of – there's always comparisons being made between National Guard units and so-called regular army, although I think by the time you get to this point in the war, there's no real marked difference yeah. in that recruits have come in from everywhere. But I would say that the same applies to territorial units in the British Army, that there is – maybe more of a sense of where you're from with a National Guard unit. There's a sense of coming from a particular region. I know people come from all over the place, but they, you know, in the British Army, even you you have a Welsh unit in 1944, half of the men are not Welsh, but they still, when they join the Welsh units, adopt Welsh traditions. They eat raw leeks on St. David's Day, that kind of thing. So, so to compare to perhaps the, f- the first or one of the more, you know, the third infantry or something, I would think the 28th has more of a, of a keystone perception and values and you said there that's why they fight would would that be something that had kept them going through the hurt and the battle of bowls that sense of fighting not just for the man beside you but the man beside you being being a brother from the same area does that is there something there well i think that's true a lot of people uh, went to the same armories you know and then they got yep. uh, activated and were and, and followed each other along with the same units um but again that that a dynamic kind of fell apart after the the first initial attack on the um, Siegfried line, and they got beat up there a little bit, and they they were moved back into Belgium, refitted a little bit, went to Hurtgen. It's not the same group of people. Mm. It's just not. It's different. They're different people. So that's what made me th- start to wonder, well, why did they fight then? Because it's mm. always been this sentiment, you're fighting for your buddy. You know, you, you're fighting, this is camaraderie. Well, what camaraderie could you develop when you only know the guy for three days? Yeah. You know what I mean? And what are your conclusions? There's more to it. But, you know, you hit a good point, too, though. Uh, you know, the, the, the 20th Division is the oldest organized division in the United States Army. 1869. It was developed. It was uh, or 1879. I'm sorry. It was uh, organized by Congress, authorized by Congress. Right. And and um, many of the uh, of units, the 1st Cavalry unit, for instance, in Philadelphia, is history goes back to Ben Franklin's associators. Mm. So... 
it's a stored unit, you know, and um, the, the men knew that. Uh, th they were told that and um, in their briefings and through all throughout the way, you know, you get all the history of the unit and everything, you know, and so that certainly adds to it as well. And what were your conclusions as to, as to why they fight? I mean, without giving away everything in the book, but you know, a couple of bullet points. I mean, is there anything particularly unique do you thought the 28th by this point? I mean, people bond in some ways better through adversity than they do in triumph. You know, look at, look mm -hmm. at the, in some ways, the positives that came out of the COVID era in that people kind of found connections again uh, with each other because I'm not in any way, folks, comparing COVID to World War II, but, you know, there's a, there's a broad parallel to be to be taken there. So, you, you know, we started off by talking about coming out the Hogan Forest. Does adversity bring people together? I think it does to some extent. I mean, you're, you're, looking, you're, after, um, you're looking after each other. You know, you're, you, you want to survive it. You want to go home. The point I'm trying to—I was trying to make in my doctoral dissertation and in the book now—that's um, coming out as a result of it—is that because they were weren't the same group that trained together, the idea of group dynamics and camaraderie, in my mind, kind of goes by the wayside. So there had to be some other reason that drove those men to fight so fiercely and, again, in many cases, to the last man. And I think it comes down to what was promoted as, uh, going back to Roosevelt, speech, you know, speeches, and uh, propaganda, if you will, posters and, 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 and chaplains uh, emphasizing the point, uh, what was presented as the American way of, of life. Mm freedom for religion, uh, freedom from want, freedom to do, you know, to exercise your voting rights, uh, all those types of things, you know, freedom from being distraught, you know, uh, like the Germans, Nazis, they read, they knew what the Nazis were doing in Germany. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. It was put out as Japanese had done. So if it's not camaraderie, which is had, had up to this point, I think I, I bought into a lot of that as well. And so I started thinking about it. That's an easy way to say, well, that's the reason they fought camaraderie. Well, really? Well, you didn't know the guy. So what camaraderie are you talking about here? You know, there has to be something else. So I think those are the bullet points. It's the main bullet point is I think they fought for the American, what they perceived to be and what was promoted as the American way of life. They thought they were going to go home. They were getting ready for Christmas. The Germans have spoiled that plan. And they said, enough. We're not going to let this happen. Well, that's been beautifully put. But to kind of round things off, let's talk about the aftermath. You explain the casualties they had they take in the hurt gun. The Ardennes, similar but different. By January, what remains the 28th division? Where are they? What what are the scores and losses? Well, um, they blended they blended back in to the 101st and other units, you know, after the initial and then around January, mid-January or so, they start to re reconstitute themselves again as a, as a division. And they, you know, they continued on and uh, went into Germany and um, just followed along with the other advancing troops. And, you know, then, then the end of the war came, you know? Yeah. The, the story of many, but by that point, yeah. everybody's kind of what war is winding down in some ways, the, the, the same way. So the 28th division, we'll, we'll go back to this idea of, what they fought for, for, why they stood to each other. But also this idea of the fact that they are maybe the the forgotten unit in terms of the Ardennes. And so we're now at the point where it'll be 80 years on next year from when that battle was fought. And the, the chances speaking to veterans are more or less past. That door has pretty much closed on us now. Everybody is assured to know about the 101st Airborne and Baston. That, that story is not going to fade away. I do think the Battle of the Bulge has been rather reduced to Joachim Piper's movement from the German point of view towards the north, the Hunden first, and a few other actions. Where are we at its study? If you were to walk down town you live and speak to a historical group there, from your experience, what do people know about the Ardennes and what should they know? And what are your hopes for making sure these stories are still being told in, in the next generations? There's a significant challenge with getting the newer generation I teach at a uh, community college. Mm -hmm. So these are kids that are coming just out of high school, right? And I read a statistic the other day that I think gives you, kind of puts it in a perspective. Over 65% of people that age have no idea what the word Auschwitz means. Mm. Yeah. Let alone, do they know anything about the Battle of the Bulge? Most people, especially that generation, if they've taken the interest at all, 
know about the Battle of the Bulge from the movies. Yep. Movies yeah. and video games. Yeah, in Britain it was announced. Video games is a very good point. Sixty yeah. percent of Britons think that Churchill was a fictional character. <laughs> yeah, was one I yeah, read. Really, the so, that's unbelievable. <laughs> okay, we laugh, but it's not funny, really. That's our challenge. And the other thing we're trying to do at the Division Association is not only uh, capture the stories, which you know I've, we've interviewed as many as we can, veterans that are alive. We have their stories. We're working to get them put into a database that uh, researchers and students can, can access in the future, uh, but also uh, capture the stories of recent deployments because yeah. now these are younger people. And oh, absolutely. I, with you 100% on that, there's a, we're going down a massive rabbit hole, but there's a big problem in Britain, for example, with younger veterans, because they still are veterans even if they're fought in different wars, don't feel mm-hmm. necessarily that they are part of the British Legion, the veterans, because – because how can you go in the door where the World War II guys were there? They're, surely they're the ones that earned that right. And if you fought in the modern war, somehow you're not on the same level. You're not at the same public affection. And, and of, of course, that's just rot. I mean, if you've served your country, you've served your country. No matter what the war, no matter what the cause, no matter how long you served. But that's a problem in, in Britain. I think it's a problem in France as well, is that there's a, you know, where I live, is that people have a feeling that a modern veteran is, is not up to measure of the, the wartime veterans. But I think to end things on a positive, and I'm, I like the fact you're talking about the fact you want to get these, this information, you know, digitized and, and put into a database, because I'm finding the revolution is with the grandchildren of the World War II generation. The World War II guys, as we all know, half of them didn't want to talk about it at all. The others had to be kind of persuaded to talk about it. Okay. The children would be interested, but the, the, the veterans didn't often tell their children what they, what they were doing, and the children aren't for the generation and maybe knew how to scan documents. We're finding in Normandy now, it's the grandchildren who are the ones who've come. They've scanned the diary. They've got all the Google Earth coordinates. They've got all the maps there, and they say, Granddad was with the, whatever it would be, the 110th Regiment, and we know he went from this town to this town to this town to this town. Can you show us where the these locations are now i'm using real broad sweeping generalizations among the generations here but that is where i feel the revolution is and it's you know, the same with the people who watch this channel the the people who are younger they have resources at their fingertips that you know i'm 54 now when i was in my 20s it was libraries that's what i had i had libraries yeah. um yeah, and and now they can go on and and do incredible work just by looking at high resolution aerial photos and and pulling it up and looking at, oh, that must be a knocked out tank there. That must be a tank track going through there. And then you download the uh, the morning reports, the Arthur Action reports, so you can build up 360-degree versions of these battles. So I, I would like to end by saying that the people like yourself, and I'm not saying you're the upper end of the, but you're certainly not a, you're certainly not a teenager. <laughs> no. It's that you're, you're leaving a legacy for future generations to, to build on and, and take your work, take what I do on my channel and improve on it make it better use all the, the abilities they will have in the future to bring these things forward and make sure make sure that the 28th division's history is told in a way that the next generation will want uh, and it may not be I, I get all faint when i hear when i when i consider the fact people don't like books i mean but but books aren't everything i i it's true there are people who watch my channel who don't read books at all yep. um and that's fine that as long as they're getting their history from somewhere and that's where it all comes down to well, and, you know, I can write about it and I have, and but coming on a program like this and hopefully we get viewers that maybe don't read books or are not going to read yeah. any of my books or read about the 20th Division, but know a little bit more about it now yeah. that um, you say, you know, I didn't realize that. That's interesting. Maybe I'll research it a little bit more. Exactly. That, that's that's the hope. That, that it's, a, it's a starting point. So, Walter, it's been fantastic talking to you. I will buy, invite you back next May. Um, uh, maybe we could do something about the 28th uh, in Normandy or, or the Hurt Gun or something else or, or, or something else you've learned. Or the reduction of the Colmar Pocket. That, that would do. Colmar that. Pocket would work. That would be uh, mm-hmm. in, with time. But it's been great t- talking to you. Um, so, um, folks, you know what to do. Like and comment and share what we're doing on social media and leave your comments. And if you've got any information about 28th Division from your family, put it in the comments down. I'll make sure I pass it on to Walter. So um, there we are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, appreciate it.